Welcome back uh, to another Real Talk with Dr. Jim Sharps. It's a great privilege, Dr. Sharps, that you take the time to be with us uh, regularly talking about um, health topics from the perspective of original medicine. Um, for those of you that are joining us again, we thank you for coming back to our channel and engaging with our content. We really do appreciate it. Um, for those of you that are kind of regular viewers here, you know that we like doing things in series. Um, and the latest uh, kind of focus we have um, in Real Talk is, is looking at RBTI. It's something that as a, as a school, as an organization, that we're really investing a lot of our time, energy and resources into. Um, so we really wanted to break down RBTI. So it was understandable for people who had no prior knowledge. So just say so they have a base understanding and a framework through which they can decide if they want to explore further. Um, so previously, just to catch everybody up, we've looked generally at RBTI. We're now in the phase of the series where we're looking at specific tests. There's seven elements to the RBTI test, and we're going through those each each video just to give you a bit more insight and information. Mm -hmm. um, so last week we covered the uh, BRICS uh, element of the RBTI test. If you haven't um, watch that video. I would encourage you to go back and do that if you want to follow along. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at another element of the RBTI tests, which are the urine and saliva pH. Um, so, Dr. Sharps, maybe we can jump straight in. Um, could you just tell us uh, how does the test work for the pH in terms of urine and saliva? Yes, uh, the pH is, uh, is, is an instrument. It's called a pH meter, which is probably the easiest way to measure it. Uh, some people might be familiar with the pH strips, where you can um, uh, put a, a small amount of saliva or urine on it, and it changes uh, color, and that color equates to a certain number. So there's a number for for pH. The the second and third numbers equate uh, focus on the urine pH and the saliva pH. So that's what that is. And in terms of the pH, what does the test identify in, maybe we can start with what do they individually identify, and then you can kind of maybe go on and say how they uh, correlate together and how they interrelate. Okay, yes. Uh, the, the urine pH basically has a, a very big correlation to uh, how fast uh, or how slow your digestion is. So that is an, uh, that's one of the important things it tells you. The other thing it tells you is a little bit about your mineral status. It tells you whether or not you have the right amount or the right balance, the appropriate amount of alkaline and um, acid um, uh, minerals in the body. There are some 84 minerals in the body and you need the right balance, the right proportion and the right amounts for your system to operate. So that, that's what that urine pH is usually telling you about. Uh, usually about your mineral and in particular your calcium uh, status. And it tells you a lot about your digestion. Um, uh, um, integrity. The, the saliva pH is, is, is basically a very good representation of the liver function and the liver bile. So the saliva pH is the same as the liver bile. And you can see the, the, the practicality of the test. You don't have to get any bile to, to be able to do the test. You just take your saliva and, that, and, that, and, and they are very closely related. So the, so the one tells you ab about digestive function uh, uh, and, and mineral status. And, th and then again, the saliva is telling you about uh, the liver function. And the liver has a very important function, as you know, it's second to the brain in terms of organs that, you know, it creates all these enzymes, some 5 billion to 6 billion enzymes a day. And it's the richest reservoir of calcium and all the minerals that you need because the liver is where you start forming all of these protein molecules for replacing cells. That's clear. Appreciate you clarifying that, um, Dr. Jim. Um, so in terms of uh, the saliva and the urine pH element of the RBTI test, what do they reveal about diet and lifestyle? Right. Um, and they are very closely related. See, a lot of people, first of all, the pH scale is from zero to 14. Uh, the, the human body functions between 4.8 and 8.0. So it's, it's that range that you're looking at. And there's an optimum range for both of those for, for efficient digestion. And if you start varying from what that optimum is, uh, then the digestion can be too fast or too slow. And, and if it's too slow, of course, you have a predisposition towards things like constipation, 
It was too fast towards diarrhea. Uh, it also has implications in terms of uh, the, the, the um, proliferation of fungus, viruses, uh, parasites. So it has a lot to do with that whole gastrointestinal um, efficiency, effectiveness, and function. And, and again, it also talks about, um, based on what those numbers are, it tells you if you have the adequate amount of minerals to make hair, nail, skin, organs, tissues, et cetera. I uh, appreciate that. And just going back to something you said uh, previously, you mentioned, uh, you know, there's a different range in terms of a pH range that mm. the, the body um, is the optimum, um, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, what do good numbers in terms of pH of saliva and urine, what do they what do they mean? What do they look like? And why is that a good thing that the numbers are in that range? You've alluded to it before, but I think it'd be good to highlight that again. Well, that's a really good question, because I said the scale is from zero to 14. So a lot of people are of the belief that seven is that neutral, perfect number, uh, and, and it's not. Um, seven, uh, actually, sp to be specific, 7.3 to 7.4 is perfect for blood pH, but not for urine and saliva pH. And so a lot of people have that mis, mis uh, information that, that mis, um, uh, uh, misconstruing that. The perfect numbers are 6.4 for both of those. So if you're 6.4, and your pH is 6.4 in, in saliva pH, that is perfect. That's where you have perfect digestion and the least amount of energy loss in your food. Uh, so so that, that, that question you asked is very important. And, and so you can see the two numbers. So by themselves, they, they, they mean something, but then also, you know, uh, they relate to each other. So the more of a differential, differential there is between the urine and saliva pH, those, those are also implications in terms of various health um, uh, statuses, issues, and, and digestive effectiveness and, and, um, uh, and, 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 and efficacy. Yes. Oh, that's clear. And, and just again, picking up on something you just said, you, you mentioned that um, when there's a too big of a difference between the numbers, that that's kind of something that you as a practitioner, yeah. you would be looking at and yes. trying to dig into. Um, I was going to ask you next, you know, what do bad numbers look like and what do right. they signify? So right. in terms of that piece, uh, Dr. Jim, when there are big gaps between the urine and saliva pH, they're obviously you've said already they're they're bad numbers if i can say it that way what does that indicate about the diet and lifestyle what what kind of um contributing factors if we can use that phrase would cause that divergence between the the phs yes um and 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 there can be differentials in each number so the more you you go from 6.4 their implications and problems and and for each one they're, they're kind of different implications but but to answer your question specifically about the differentiation between the urine and pH, uh, one of the things to understand is that, that those numbers are not arithmetic, they're logarithmic. So, you know, uh, a one tenth of a difference doesn't sound like much. And to be very specific, anytime there's more of a two tenths of a, of a difference, then you start losing energy and you start having problems. So if you have like a 6.2 over, over 6.6, .6, that, that's a that's a, a gap or either way uh, a 6.4 over 6.2 and it has implications in terms of uh, of digestion um, efficiency effectiveness um, uh, um, digestive integrity and the higher that number is the more you're tending towards slow digestion so when you start getting towards 6.8 seven up getting close close towards uh, eight, there are very significant impl impl implications in terms of the digestive uh, speed. Uh, and so it's moving way too slow. And if it, the, the lower it is, so if it's in the fives, for example, then it's moving too fast. So you're eating the food, but are you really getting the nutrients out of it? So remember, we said all along when we talk about a lot of different other health issues, when we talk about nutrition, it's not what you eat, it's what you assimilate. And this is a very good tool for, for measuring uh, what, what is going on um, with your meal. 
So you, you, you would implement this test about one and a half to two hours after a meal. It tells you what happened during that meal. And, and it also tells you uh, what's going to happen just by looking at the different uh, relationships in those numbers that, that you talked about. And that's what we cover in, in, in a lot of detail in the courses. But you can see there can be a lot of implications in terms of which number uh, itself is differentiated from the 6.4 and then how are they differentiated with each other. But in the final analysis, it has to. It basically tells you how effective your liver is functioning, how effective your, um, uh, how effective your diet is, your lifestyle, what things that are going on that's impacting the minerals that you need for not only digestive, but for um, uh, you know organ and other health issues that we have a lot of named issues for. But basically, it's, it's this imbalance of minerals and this inadequacy of minerals. And that's what the pH is really measuring. See, the, the, the liver needs um, all 84 of those minerals in order to, to make the full spectrum of all of the tissues, cells, et cetera, that the body needs. And if you're missing any of them, uh, the implication is that uh, in order to be able to, to replace dead and dying cells, you have to pull from your organ reserves. And, and, and you can see the long-term effect of that as you start diminishing that bank account, you become bankrupt in certain organs. And, and, and so you start out with a deficiency and then the lead, that leads to kind of de deterioration and, and, and then dysfunction and then destruction. So those are the four Ds that occur uh, that you can, you can start to analyze and manage. And it gives you very good clues of what kind of minerals are missing, what you need um, uh, and, and, and why you're having these all these named diseases, which is basically um, uh, a result of uh, of poor, um, uh, as you as we talked about, dietary and lifestyle factors that are being measured in that in that pH. That's clear. Appreciate that. And just the final question as we focus on on the urine and saliva pH. How do the urine and saliva pH elements of the RBTI test, how do they interrelate with the other uh, elements of the test? We've already covered BRICS, so maybe, you know, how do BRICS and, and pH interrelate, if they do at all? Wow, that's, that's another really good question. And, and, and specifically, uh, you know, the digestive system needs water. So, so BRICS, remember we talked about, uh, if the BRICS is too high, it's usually because you don't have sufficient water. So if you're not having sufficient water, you don't have enough water for the body to make the enzymes and the chemicals and, and, the, and the juices necessarily, it's necessary for digestion. So you can see already how the BRICS relates to the, uh, um, uh, um, to, uh, the, the pH. Also, the BRICS also has to do with oxygen availability ability and utilization. And the three things that the liver must have in order to function properly are calcium, um, oxygen, and water. So if, if you're not getting good oxygen availability, if you don't have sufficient water, the liver can't function right. So you can see how those two numbers relate. And then we haven't talked about ureas yet, which is at the end of the scale, but you can be t t putting in your body the best quality proteins, but if it's not being digested, you're gonna, it's, it's, you're gonna just spill it out and you're gonna have the, these, these really high urea numbers, which uh, also can, uh, is, speaking to a number of health issues that are you either are experiencing or about to experience based on how long that issue is occurring. So uh, one of the things that we didn't talk about, but it's very important to understand is when you look at all of these numbers, you need to look at it in the context of gender, age, height, weight, even sometimes ethnicity, et cetera, because all of those factors play into what, what those numbers represent. So specific, specifically for pH, just let me end there. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that women have 700%, seven times the requirement of calcium than men. And I've always was confused until I understood RBTI, why I always had more female clients than males. And I used to think it's because they're sensitive, they care, uh, and this, that, and the other thing. But, but the reason why is, is that you see the 80-20 rule is because women have this higher requirement. So if they're having the same diet and lifestyle as men, they can't take the same liberties. And, 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 um, uh, and, 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 and
and if they do, uh, if they try, it's going to impact their calcium stores. And so that's why a lot of doctors don't really understand women because most doctors are men. Women are coming in and they're explaining these things. Men don't have any clue. These male doctors don't have a clue what they're talking about. So they think it's in their head. And so they'll say, well, you need your, your anti-anxiety, anti-depression, et cetera. And in point of fact, um, poor pH will have a diminution of certain minerals that will affect your mood. So, so diet and lifestyle doesn't only affect you physically, but affects you emotionally and mentally as well. So you can start to see these complex relationships that can be managed with these sets of numbers. And so far, we just talked about bricks and pH. And you can see why this is such a powerful tool to be able to monitor, manage, uh, uh, manage and be empowered to uh, take care of your health. Know what the causes and contributing factors are and address that rather than chasing the results of uh, those, um, uh, you know, these, these compromised um, uh, diet and lifestyle factors. Does Dr. that Jim, make sense at all? Super clear, Dr. Jim, makes, makes total sense. And, and I hope it does uh, make sense to the people watching this video. If there's any gaps or anything that's unclear, please leave a comment. We really do want to engage with, with our community that's, that's growing now. Uh, we're nearly at 1,000 subscribers, so we'd love, if you've appreciated this content, do hit like, do hit subscribe, make sure you've hit the bell notification so you know when we upload a, a new video. Uh, but Dr. Jim, thank you once again for your time, for explaining what are not easy concepts uh, in a very understandable way, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye for now. You're very welcome. Bye for now, and God bless.